You know, sometimes when you just see somebody pop up in the limelight, we just thought, oh, well, that's it. They just woke up one morning and then that was it. They were superstars in the limelight. But indeed, they have studied hard. They've gone through hard times. They've been through the fire, being molded, polished and everything. And then we get to see them. But during the fire and the oven and the furnace and the modeling, you know, you never hear anything about them. And that's what inspires people, particularly on the Fridays, uh, personality. No one that's probably one of the biggest, when we get our biggest audience, when we all want to pick a seed or two from somebody's life experience to mold us. And our guest today definitely has a thing or two to teach you and I. Stay tuned. And thank you very much, uh, Auntie Betty Mold Idris. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having us. I mean... You're a superstar, I mean, by far, you know, you're in the media. I wouldn't have even have to mention your name and everybody would know who you are. And so sometimes we just think, well, that's it. You know, they just popped up there and started enjoying. I want to go all the way back, probably, no, I don't want to say the age, it's rude to say a woman's age. So many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> Several centuries later. You know, several <laughs> centuries later. Uh, but I mean, you don't have that sorry story where, you know, we walked barefooted to school and, you know, had one calabash to share amongst all of us. I mean, you have a better, you know, nicer story. Well, is it nicer <laughs> or, you know, I, I was privileged hmm. with my father came from British Accra. You see that? Chipstown. <laughs> where we wore shoes before everybody else. <laughs> but my late mother came from a small village in the middle of the Ashanti forest, <laughs> which is now um, almost metropolitan, I would say. It's in the constituency of Kwabre. Okay. And the district capital, now it's a metropolitan capital, you know, is um, very close now to Kumasi. In fact, they want to call them Kumasi um, Metropolis, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Metropolitan, mm -hmm. because they are, they are so close. And we are Idretia. Our adjacent villages are in Pubi, which is actually Madame Nana Konedu's village okay. of her mother's. And then we have Hemain, which um, is one of the larger villages. And then we have Ankasi, which is, I think, the largest of the villages. So it's, we're off the beaten road. And I remember very well, I was there just a couple of days ago and telling my uncle that I remember the first time I came here sleeping in the mud hut. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not quite true to say we didn't all know about mud huts and mm -hmm. you know this type of thing. Did you enjoy village life then? You know, more freedom than in Jamestown? Because <laughs> any time you get in the village you were not more restricted, you could roam uh -huh. about. That's true. British Accra has, I was born overlooking the sea, <laughs> you know, in the Trot <laughs> Street, so British Accra has always been home to me. Mm -hmm. But um, when I was a child, mother, daughters usually are closer to their mothers. So my grandmother and the Akans' influence was very clear, mm -hmm. obviously. Because my mother was the most senior of her, I think, nine siblings. And I was the most senior of my four siblings. And in fact, the only girl. So the matrilineal thing, thing is, is very sure. dominant. Very but then, dominant. But then father is patrilineal. Yes, but my father always believed in the, um, how do I say, not the domination of women, but pushing a woman up. One of my senior sisters, my father's, I think, fourth born is Professor, um, Professor, Green Street. <laughs> and as I indicated to you, my, 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 my first cousins, you know, are professors and doctors, and one was a former presidential advisor. She's just become the first chancellor yeah. of the University of Ghana. And my own sisters, you know, were very senior women in, and 
they blazed certain trails. Mm. So my father believed in that. He didn't believe. The only time I saw my father hesitate a bit is when I said after my master's that I wanted to do my PhD. And he said, but you won't get anybody to marry you now, Queen. <laughs> you know? It was the only fair, one of the few times he hesitated a little bit. You know, but um, but he, he really pushed his daughters on. He did. He pushed his daughters very remarkably. My other sister was, uh, she was from um, your part of the world, from Acropole. And she um, became one of Ghana's first women nutritionists. She held an MSc in nutrition in the 70s, oh. you know. So, we, we, so I had it from both sides. Mm. And the Akans, especially, very strong matrilineally. And um, I think that that's what made did, me the person. Uh, considering mom's background, yeah. did she believe in also pushing daughters or she was more like, look, let's domesticate them rather than, you know, get them all academic? Oh, no, no. She was very, very for, much in favor of girls going all out to reach the, to reach the skies, to capture the dreams. And it's because of the matrilineal. They believe that you can do what a man can do. Mm -hmm. And it's always held me throughout, I think, my life. I've never thought, my brothers definitely haven't thought that they could do anything better than me. No, no, no. You know, but I was privileged in one sense, and yet always knew where to, where home was. I was at home in Jamestown and at home in Idritia, you know, near Mamponting. I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very, it's very easy mm -hmm. for me. And then when I married, I went to the north. So I cross or straddle quite a few ethnic and religious mm -hmm. and cultural ranges mm -hmm. in Ghana. Wow. Good, good, good childhood? Excellent. I mean, looking back. It was great because I spent the first formative years of my life in Takaradi and then went to... Liberia with my parents, who my father was a timber, timber man, a big timber man at that time. Went to Liberia with him, and then they wanted me to get, my mother wanted me to get the British education. So I went to the UK when I was about nine years old and stayed with the foster family for about oh, four or five years. <laughs> so I came back to Ghana. And I couldn't speak a word of tree or ga or anything. So I'm predominantly English speaking. <laughs> you know, for instance, I taught myself ga. Wow. <laughs> you know, but even though it gives the appearance of being an affluent family, where we moved to stay, we, there was no electricity, no running water, <laughs> no roads, no anything at Abeka at that time. Wow. In the 60s, yes. Wow. So it it's wasn't an easy childhood. We had our own generator which broke on and off. Most of the time we were by candlelight learning, you know. I remember I could parrot Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth, you know, just <laughs> like that. And that, I believe, is the reason why I have such failing eyesight is because of this early childhood by the candlelight and you know. people don't know and we found it very tough our parents found it very tough to pay our fees but they wanted the best for us so we went to the best schools that Ghana had to offer but it was tough Blewby Blewby <laughs> <laughs> I had a checkered history to get to Blewby you know I went to Achimota okay. for the first two years and I was always ill. So I was a dad at back. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I went to Achimota 64, 65. Then we had the coup. No, I went to Achimota 65, 66. 65 was very interesting because Kwame Nkrumah declared a four year system of education. So I went straight into Form 2. And then um, they had the coup. 66, they said, no, we revert back to the five years. So I was informed too again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was 
ill, you know, for a long time. So my father said that, okay, I should go to a day school. And I went to Ghana International School okay. at that time. And um, they said, oh, but you've been doing a different type of maths. So they put me in Form 2 again. So I did Form 2 <laughs> three times. <laughs> but, well, I all, all said and done, you know. Was, I, was he upsetting then, thinking, look... I just took it in my stride. I didn't, you know, you don't realize I didn't like maths very much anyway. <laughs> so I didn't see why I was, I, I only kept thinking, why am I being subjected to all this arithmetic, <laughs> arithmetic, arithmetic? At that time, that's what it was, it was arithmetic. But um, I, you know. Eventually you got out of form two. Yes, I got out <laughs> of form two, finished O levels at GIS, and then went to London and fell ill again and came back to Ghana and did um, a year at Accra Academy. Mm. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of the pioneers of the girls going Coming to, to sixth form. Six form. So it was great being a girl in Accra Academy <laughs> in those days. I mean, they I called me back several times afterwards and, you know, it's great. <laughs> I can imagine working by the boys getting all excited. <laughs> <laughs> we were in sixth form, so there were just a few of us. Because I was a blow B too. Uh -huh. yeah, I mean, Best uh, school in Accra. Yeah, we used to get excited just uh -huh. seeing the girls walk into class. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> boys being boys. Uh, <laughs> the boys uh, being boys. Uh, so from then to Legon? To Legon, yes. It was an experience because I still had a lingering illness, you know. And it was, and it, so I was in the Walter Hall and um, I was home a lot and I told my mom, ah, I really think I'll try to go to, I would like to experience the mixed hall because most of the schools I'd been to were mixed. Mm -hmm. I wasn't used to an all girls environment. I'm still very close with all my Chimota so mm -hmm. the class of 1970. I'm very close with them mm -hmm. still. And, you know, it gave me that foundation. GIS was mixed, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Accra Accra was mixed. So I went to Saba Hall and had a very good time. I was going to use another <laughs> word, then I remembered that one TV. <laughs> I had an excellent time at Saba Hall. Some fantastic classmates, some fantastic seniors. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I've carried the tradition through. We set up the Illumini, the Vikings, you know. They had uh, a session on May 1st, but I couldn't attend that. So, you know, I'm on their platform. We did a celebrity platform. We raised funds. We built a hall for them, all kinds of things. And it was out of those interactions at that time. By this time, you wanted to be a lawyer? No, I never <laughs> wanted to do law. I wanted to do archaeology. So... Um, when I got to Legon, so I was filling out the forms with my mom. And then when I got to Legon, I saw. Archaeology? My, yes. Definitely Dadaba. Yes. I, I saw de my name. Definitely Dadaba. Ah! <laughs> no, I was interested in ancient Greek philosophy <laughs> and, you know, all things medieval and, you know, the slave, um, the, the, the slave roots at that time. They hadn't even started publicizing it, mm. you know, here in Ghana. But I was interested in all these ancient things. And my grandmother used to tell me all these stories, you know, and about our culture, the Akan culture and so on. So I was interested, I've always been interested in it. Then when I got to the school, I didn't see my name at the archaeology department. And somebody said, oh, Betty, we saw your name at the law faculty. I said, law? How did my name get there? Long story, but when I went to check at the law faculty, my name was there. How did this happen? So I went home and told my mother, can you believe it? She said, oh, God is good. She canceled out <laughs> the archaeology and put law. Because she had always wanted me to be a lawyer. So there I was, you know, in the law faculty. And I loved it. I was, there were about eight or ten of us girls in the class mm. at that time. And then they took 60 of us to do the LLB, you know, and I have some very illustrious classmates 
from 1973. Wow. Fellow faculty. Some who were called before me in 78 because I then went and did a master's at LSC. Okay. Uh -huh, and came back. So I did law. I did, sorry, the... Um, I did the Mokala, uh, the professional law course. Yes. At that time, it was two years, fourth year and fifth year. You do three years at Legon, then you do fourth year and fifth year at Mokala. But because I had a master's, they exempted me from certain subjects. But then didn't give the exemptions, it didn't correlate with anything. So I was going to classes with both fifth years and fourth years at the same time, and sometimes the classes would overlap each other. Then at the end of the time, they told me that, well, they had forgotten to tell me that I had to do family law. I had to write an exam in family law, at which time I'd been exempted from. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Echo Daniels and the late Darucha at that time. So we managed. I went and picked up a colleague's notes on the law, on family law, and just read it like a storybook. And I got one of the highest marks <laughs> in, in the, you know, in all my papers in family law. I think, um, but it was difficult to do the. It was difficult to do the the final exams. I could only do it because in 79, they gave an extension of three months because all of our lecturers were doing politics. <laughs> <laughs> they were all running for political office. So they, and the election, I think, was in June or July. Mm. So they said that they couldn't teach us, so we should wait <laughs> until <laughs> September. And it enabled me to then catch up because I'd had a baby then. Okay. <laughs> wow. Wow. In the wow. same year, wow. 1979. Who, who are some of your classmates that, that, that we may know? Oh, in law? oh. Uh, it's a range of them. The girls, um, oh, they're not girls now, we're no. all retirees. <laughs> um, Amma Bamful, was, uh, she was chief state attorney with me okay. at the Ministry of Justice. I met uh, Amma Gezi as well, who became Solicitor General. May Lewood, she's an appeal court judge. They were, I think Maylee was a year ahead of me. Then in the class, um, in fact, Nana Kufuado's late wife, Omar Elena Katsadramina okay. was there. Um, Nana, uh, Nana, oh, a whole lot of them. And then the boys, we have Cletus Aboka, okay. who was, with me, Martin Amidu was in the class of 17, I mean in the first um, year we entered 73. Professor Mills taught us, Justice Duce, who is now at the Supreme Court, was also uh, uh, in the class of 73 with me. And, and another Supreme Court judge was also, <laughs> <laughs> he's still a Supreme Court judge. So, I, and as I said, Professor Mills told me, it was a glorious time at the Faculty of Law. And I think that's what even propelled me later on in life to go back and teach. Professor Mills was there, Professor Ikuya Kwehinya, Professor Akila Pasoya, wow. Professor Kwesi Bochi, Chachu Chikata. Wow. You know, it was just <laughs> the most glorious time. It was the golden age of law as far as I'm concerned. Wow. And they did so much for us and laid the foundation for me to do intellectual property law. And for mm. some of us, they opened up the road to our path in social democracy, you know. Mm. And it was just an incredible experience. By, the, by this time, have you forgotten about archaeology? Completely forgotten. <laughs> 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 so I always thank my mother. <laughs> I mean, when you graduated, did she make any comments like archaeology? Did she make a comment like archaeology? Actually, my father died just a week before I, I was oh, called to the bar. Yes, because he, uh, he was so. I was his only daughter who was a lawyer, and he was in 
so intent on celebrating my call to the bar with me, you know. So it was a personal tragedy, mm -hmm. but my aunties and my relatives all pulled together. And we had a, we had a good commemoration. So after law school, were you going to set up privately or were you going to join? You know, I, I was given a, 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 a scholarship. I told you that the family, the facade of being, you know, um, wealthy is, you know, they think that. But we had real problems in, you know, paying school fees and other things. So, for example, at Shimota, I was given a bursary throughout because I excelled in English mm. and history and those things, not arithmetic. <laughs> <laughs> But I got a master's, I got my master's through a bursary okay. and a, a scholarship, they call mm -hmm. it now, yes, a scholarship, and went to LSE, okay. did at the instance of Dr. Kwesibuchi and Akila Kwasoya at that time. I did intellectual property law, yeah. which um, they said there was a complete deficit of in Ghana. And at that time, the public service was so incredible. They headhunt you. And as a condition of me having done a master's degree on government scholarship, I had to come and work with the government. For, you know, they bond you for a period of two yeah. or three years. So I went to the Ministry of Justice. And I was transferred. I was, well, enrolled into the... the Registrar General's Department, which is the department that still, up till today, despite my best efforts, but it still deals <laughs> with patents and trademarks. So that is what I did for 10 years until I was then transferred and did uh, to the, had the copyright office and became the copyright administrator for Ghana. So I did intellectual property all my life. And I must say that I did a bit of private practice, um, but my heart wasn't in it. And that was with my lifelong friend. And the first person I met when I went to the Registrar General's, uh, lawyer Felix Intraqua. He has a solid, solid, solid practice in commercial law, company law, and teachers. And he's a member even of the International Arbitration um, Commission. So you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1980. I, wore, I shared the office with him, and he has mentored me ever since. What, what, what's your passion with uh, the intellectual law? Because I know you contributed a great deal to that. Was it a, there was a loophole somewhere? We didn't grasp it properly? No, there was just nobody who knew anything about it. Mm. We were um, implementing the laws as they stood in the pre-colonial times, colonial times, mm -hmm. and the aftermath, you know. So these were laws from the 60s and the 70s. And the law of intellectual property is just what it says, that you own something which you've created by your intellect, mm -hmm. whether it be a patent, a book, a musical recording, or etc. And um, it's not common to our culture in Africa. Mm. In Africa, we have a common cultural heritage where we all own kinti, for example. Yeah. You know, you can't say who patterns. owns adinkra, for example. So everybody is free to use the adinkra patterns. And that is different from the intellectual property, where once you make it, you own it. Recognizing the fact that Ghana had a long and distinguished history in textiles and textile, cre the design and creation of textile designs, we had somewhat very uniquely a textile design law which gave the rights to those who create textile designs, like what I'm wearing and what you are wearing, <laughs> eh? they gave them a right for seven years and another renewal rights for seven years. 
Then after so, that, anybody and can... And after that, anyone can use it. You see? So this is... This we, is we have been educated here. <laughs> <laughs> I was a teacher for too long. So this is, you know, and when I got into it, I realized that very few people knew what they were doing. So all the patents and trademarks were just being re-registered by a very few patent attorneys. It was not my interest. My interest was to educate people. So I started lecturing at the Faculty of Law. I got the uh, program instituted as an elective at the law faculty. And I taught for 10 years from 1990 to 2000. I taught intellectual property law as an elective subject. I taught, I, I marked papers, and then I dragged along uh, Professor Kuti and um, Yao Bene, who's also one of my classmates. I dragged them along and they taught the transfer of technology. And I didn't even teach copyright. I taught patent law, you know, and Kuti taught uh, um, copyrights at that time. <laughs> I'll take a break here and find out if you enjoyed your life as a teacher. Uh, or was it, was it a chore? Was it a pleasure? Don't go. We're coming straight back. Well, thank you very much for you know, staying and... See, this is how it works. You know, these are all the things that we don't know behind the scenes. The schools, the challenges, falling sick, coming back, going, striving forward, aiming to, you know, dig up mummies but then end up at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy your life as a teacher? I did. I did. I, did. It, I always tell people, when they ask me what was, what was the most enjoying, rewarding, fulfilling part, because I have a very multifaceted life. Yeah. I say teaching. Wow. My, my former students, some of them are very famous people in Ghana now. And I have such an excellent relationship with them. It was the imparting of knowledge and the getting back from the youth, the feedback. I had a wonderful relationship with them. And I still do today. Oh, my three, three of my best friends, you know, uh, prominent lawyers, and they were my first batch of students. Mm. And three, the three of them, who are from different political traditions, would come to me like this in a heartbeat to come and represent me in any matter. Wow. I kept up that relationship with them. And they know themselves. I don't want to know them. <laughs> <laughs> they know themselves. That's wonderful. Yes. So at, at which point did you get into your political life? Was not all been academic and everything? So has it You've been... forgotten about my gender, and that is a great part of my life. I know that you were part of the uh, West African female lawyers. No, 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 no. It's not only that. It's we started off with the women lawyers movement. At that time, it was headed by Kriya Kwenya. Okay. And then it was FIDA. Yeah. FIDA is the International Federation. Okay, I didn't realize you were part of FIDA. Yes. Oh, okay. I became the president of FIDA Ghana. And then I became the president of FIDA Africa. <laughs> and then I formed my own group, the African Women Lawyers Association. So that is still in existence. I'm 20 years later. We're wow. hoping to celebrate 20 years next year. Wow. And we wow. still do an enormous amount of, well, not enormous, but we still do a lot of work in training, you know, the security services, etc., on gender rights. So, How come it's not so out there? Because you are younger than I. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody at that time Sorry. only associated me with gender work. When okay. they see me, they say, oh, Madame Fida, Madame Fida, Madame we did a lot of work simplifying the laws. That time they had just passed the um, interstate succession law. We did a lot of works bringing the law to the reach of the women by going out. And we did a lot of work on domestic violence. We set up the coalition on domestic violence. We, we subsequently, one of the proudest movements my personally had as attorney general 
was when I was able to lay the bill, the bill, two bills in Parliament. One was for the amendment of the proper, sorry, one was for the amendment of the interstate succession law to give spouses more, even more share in their deceased spouse's property. And the other was the, what they call, um, under the constitution, as a constitutional provision, which asked, requested parliament to ensure that upon the dissolution of marriage, eh, spouses get an equitable share of the marital property. I put it <laughs> before I laid it in Parliament in 2010. Till date, that bill has not been passed into law. Till now. Too many now, men in Parliament. Now, huh? now. Too many men <laughs> and not enough understanding. Mm. We did a lot of work in trying to simplify that, going out with the MPs themselves, with the select committees, to um, get people to understand it. We modified the law. We did so much. And up till now, I believe that the law hasn't been passed. So I've been involved in gender all my life. And I think that I've created some very transformational you know, agendas and, and issues. And um, I've been recognized multiple times in, for my work in gender across Africa and in Ghana. All the women lawyers know me. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. All of them. Let's go back a little bit. Do you, do you think the gender gap has breached a little bit now? When oh, of course. It's completely different. Now. Yeah. The landscape has transformed. And I congratulate myself, Betty Moody, not? <laughs> congratulate yourself for the work you've done in the past. It was very difficult work, you know, laying these barriers and we laying the foundations, the building blocks towards this. And let me say that the PNDC at that time brought about those laws, which were very rare in Africa, indeed are still very rare to give a uniform intestate succession law that is and which grounds the wife or the spouse it's the spouse is gender neutral yeah. so it grounds the spouse <laughs> as being able to lay claim to part of the husband's property you know it's it, it, it's it's a very terrible situation the Akans, where i come from <laughs> You know the matrilineal, yeah. and where you come from, yeah. the matrilineal sure. line. So traditionally, the spouse doesn't come into the picture. It's the nieces, nieces and, and nephews. And there's a very, very solid um, tradition surrounding mm -hmm. it. I'm not kicking at the tradition, but at the unfairness of it at that time. Thankfully now, We've had not only the law and not only all the work we did in the law, but also so many cases have come out which has clearly defined the role of a, a spouse in um, the, the distribution of property when a husband or a spouse dies intestate. Intestate means without leaving a will. Mm. And I, you still have very big people today who own huge amounts of property and who are wealthy. And they will leave, they will leave their assets, their properties to their nephews or nieces. It happens today, you know, even in the wills. So when people that, write the will, they mm -hmm. will do that and say that that is their tradition. You know. Does the law frown upon that, or in that case, then that's it? No, the law insists that upon an intestate, upon a death intestate, and if there's been a will written which seeks to exclude the interest of the spouse, a court can give back the interest of the spouse. And sometimes it happens because they quarrel or there's. Um, you know, they live apart or something. 
But so long as there hasn't been a divorce, and there usually is not mm -hmm. under Ghanaian customary mm -hmm. law. And it also brings me back to the fact that you must remember that there, we have a multiple or a, le a pluralistic legal system. So the common law, the customary law, and the statute law run together, and we administer them together. So if somebody married under the customary law, is that customary law of, in, of, in, of succession that would apply, i.e. the widow or the widower wouldn't be entitled to it. But now with the law 111, it's made, it swept away, you know. Regardless that, of how you got regardless married. Regardless of how you so, got yeah. married, regardless. Oh, so why is it a bit boring? It is a fundamental right which women acquired. And it was even a right, a law, that, you know, could really only be passed, excuse me to say this, but by a military government. Look at how long it has taken for the other law I spoke about <laughs> in Parliament. Very difficult to have these laws mm. passed in a democratic system. Yeah. As it was with the creation of new regions, very difficult provisions in the Constitution to carry out. Because MPP now have this majority, absolute majority, that is why they can think of it. It took the PNDC to create the Upper West region in um, the 80s. Mm -hmm. So these are very difficult concepts, you know. <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> Well done, well done, well done. So from gender, I'm still going to move you back into when you started got an interest in, in politics. I've always been interested in politics because of who I married. Mm. You know, uh, my husband is a politician. And so from that time, <laughs> you know, from the 70s, and my late father was a CPP man, supported Kwame Nkrumah. That's why I spoke about Green Street. Ivo yeah. is my direct nephew. <laughs> you know, the CPP side of mm -hmm. us. And, you know, my father was one of those who went to the Manchester Conference of 1944 and that type of thing. Supported Kwame Nkrumah to come home. We knew all the ministers and things. But he wasn't a politician. Okay. He preferred to do business. Um... Alaji has done politics all his, most of his mature <laughs> life. And I got involved in it very early with him. So this is the 70s. <laughs> but grassroots work, I would say that I did. In the 80s, I built up my career a lot. Because I did a lot of consulting too for the World Intellectual Property Organization in intellectual property law. So it's from the... The, the 80s and 90s that I really got involved with the grassroots work. And that's the work of the Zungus, which I did a lot in. And then the Ashanti region, because of where I came from. <laughs> so, you know, I, I really decided consciously to concentrate on the Ashanti region and the Zungus, the grassroots, and see where I could make more impact. British Accra, I thought that, well, <laughs> we are all, you know, we have a lot of educated women mm -hmm. there. But in the Ashanti region, it was a little more difficult. And I wanted to help my party. So I started voting in my village. In, from 1996, I've been voting in my village. Wow. Yeah. And it just, you know... <laughs> Um, I, how do I say, it just got more and more and more and more and more. So whilst I was supporting my husband and then getting involved in the different elections and things they were doing, the congresses, I was working with the women, I was working with the Ashanti region, I was working with the Zungus. So I've always, I know almost all of them, you know. So it's, it was a natural, you know, metamorphosis. <laughs> And then I, I, I told you that I worked with Professor Mills. Sure. And we worked in the intellectual property arena mm. afterwards, after he lectured me, when he was a commissioner of um, VAT. He started the VAT okay. regime. 
we had a system in intellectual property law of authentication of musical works, of sound recordings, and a percentage of it went straight to the state. And it was a complicated thing, but we pioneered it in Africa, in many places in the world, and I went around spreading the gospel. So I got close to Prof. He knew my capacity from that time, right. you know, from the time I was a student <laughs> all the way through. So... No wonder. No, no wonder. Yes. <laughs> Eventually. No one, no looking wonder. for women. And he was very, you know, like JM has been very, you know, trying to get women into, the, into leadership. I was one of the natural choices. See, I'm listening to you. And by the time, you know, you got into politics, you'd done your education. You've had an mm. experience. W w would you advise young ones now, look, finish you know, set yourself up or set your course before you come into politics or look, come into politics while you were... So what would be your best mix? Politics is a passion. Mm. You have to be passionate mm. about it. And it's usually the young ones who are passionate. Mm. <laughs> I, 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 I've lived with politics all my life, mm. known politicians all my life. I don't know whether my father would have agreed with what I was doing because he believed that he knew that you had to make money in order to do politics. But um, my brothers are well grounded. Mm. So I just took it for granted that, you know, that base, you know, with my husband and my brothers, there was access to, to funding. Unfortunately, I didn't realize how much funding <laughs> one needed in politics. In that, I was naive. But um, I have so much empathy and passion and affinity for the young people and especially those who are in politics. I have a lot of admiration for them. Sometimes I have to bring them down because they get carried away with, what was the <laughs> phrase? Youthful exuberance. <laughs> but, um, you know, they are the ones that the PNDC and the NDC in those days and the CPP <laughs> actually you know, propelled. And that's the base of the party. Once you have the young ones in the UK, in the US, it's really the young ones who carry it forward. And they are recruited from school. That's why I get a bit upset with Tane or, you know, uh, some of our um, uh, youth wings. That politicians are recruited from university. They knock literally door to door and you tell them, I belong to the NDC or to the MPP. This is what we believe in. Please come and join us. This is our party membership. These are the dues we pay. That is good old-fashioned politicking. Instead, now they have platforms. <laughs> <laughs> platforms, social media. Yeah. <laughs> and it's difficult to do, to recruit on social media yeah. because you're already a well-defined group, mm -hmm. you know, 200 or 300 mm -hmm. people are allowed on a platform mm -hmm. and you're all either NDC or MPP or CPP. <laughs> so how are you going to recruit more people? You know, so maybe Facebook, which mm -hmm. I'm now not on since I left Ministry of Education, <laughs> I'm not on Facebook. But maybe Facebook is a way for them to recruit. Mm -hmm. But really, I would urge the young people, go into the politics, be in the politics. There's nothing as glorious as student politics. Oh, that one you can do and say anything and damn the consequences, you know? So do it while you can. And, um, you know, when you come out, of course, have your profession. Have your profession. Have your career. But let's just be doing the politics side by side. Ministry of Justice, how difficult it is, because sometimes we hear that you don't have enough funding, you don't have enough staff, and you're overloaded with work. What's, what's the reality there? Ministry of Justice is one of the most difficult ministries to work with in that it is completely undervalued. It is undervalued, understaffed, under-resourced. When Prof invited me to go there first, I told him that I, I'm too attached to the cause of the lawyers because several times we would threaten to go on strike or on demonstration or go to court in order to get something substantive. 
and most of the lawyers look down on us, the practicing lawyers, those who go to the courtroom. So I, 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 I found it very difficult because I was so impassion, passionate about their cause. So I found it very difficult. Um, it was one of my reasons for hesitating in accepting to be the Attorney General. And then also I said, but these are all my friends, my mates, people I've worked with for the last 30 years, you know, and how can I come and be their boss, so to speak? <laughs> and then again, I don't do criminal prosecution, so it's not my forte. How can I overcome that prof? And then the systemic devaluation of the ministry. And he said, but Betty, I'm here. I know what you are going through. I'm a lawyer, I'm a professor, I know it. So we'll help. And he did help. He did help. By the time I was leaving the ministry, we had a fleet of new cars. We had, um, what do you call it? Uh, we had an e-library set up. We had um, uh, uh, the regional offices being renovated, regalvanized. We had promotions ongoing. Mm -hmm. They've always done that. But this time, we were able to get it through, you know, very um, quickly. And we had, we were creating new divisions and so on. And we were looking at the pay structure, how to revise that, together with the state attorneys and the legal service board. So because I knew the problems, I, I, was, uh, I was so sympathetic to their cause. And I also got them several training programs. Not that I would send one or two people to go and do a master's mm -hmm. or to go and do a diploma or to go and do an attachment. I would bring the lecturers to come from abroad or bring, bring lecturers from here even to do training programs for the entire Ministry of Justice and bring them from the regions. And these were people who are maybe never had the opportunity to be exposed to more. Even the judges, the judges helped us. They said, Betty, now we know this is what you want to do. We'll help you. So they were, the judges were training them. Can you imagine? Wow. They had, we were being trained at the Judicial Training Institute. The judges set up a program to train the state attorneys. As you must realize, that several of the judges, in fact, a number of judges, had come through the state uh, attorneys mm -hmm. as state attorneys. So they knew what was going on. Yes, they knew what was going on. So it's, I, I was so delighted to be able to make this impact on them. And I'm sure it's still going on. Uh, and I was even more delighted to be the first woman attorney general. Yes, yes, yes. How could I forget that? Well, maybe after all your fight in gender, you see, it was paying, it was paying by yes, karma. It, karma it, was working. It did. I must say, I thank the Lord for that. Ministry of Education, you know, uh, Little Birdies and Grapevine, you know, very grateful for some of the reforms you made there. But then you stayed there only one year. And I think next to Ministry of Justice, that's also another tricky one. What is it, what magic did you do in that year that... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a story very few people know about. Mm. Maybe, you know, they're more interested in painting one black <laughs> rather than, <laughs> rather than mm. hearing the good things. Mm. Education, wow. I was there for just one year yeah. and I so much wished I could have been there for two years or three years or four years because I think it would have been very transformational. Mm. The Schools Under Trees stands out as one mm. of our flagship programs and we really promoted it. But what I tried to do with the gender phase mm. was to understand the reasons why there was such a high school dropout of girls, mm -hmm. why the deprived communities had such terribly abysmal performances in terms of, not only in terms of passing the BECs, mm -hmm. you know, but also in terms of infrastructure and the dropout rates. And then all these stories you hear now, we heard them at that time, that almost 200,000 school children drop out every year. What can we do? 
And our answer at that time was not free SHS, <laughs> but to get there by targeting the deprived communities mm -hmm. and seeing how the impact and the roller effect it had on giving them, as I said, one school meal a day, having a school feeding program go out there. When we took over, the school feeding program was mainly in the peri-urban areas. Mm. And it was difficult to do in the rural, so to bring it out there. And then, you know, to tackle the problem of the girl child, the school feeding program, giving a child sandals to go to school and a school uniform. You have no idea of the difference it makes to a child, especially to the girls. Because then the mother doesn't have to think about it. Look, one Ghana city matters anywhere you go. And um, so, we, you know, we looked for funding from other sources other than Ghana government, GOG funding. Since most of that funding was directed at um, item one, which is salaries and allowances. My, my, my little investigation tells me that you had connections in World Bank and you personally pushed it. Oh, we tried. Not only well, but different institutions. We tried, and we tried different programs, and we tried to strengthen the, um, the, the infrastructure of the Ghana education system. The Ghana Education Council, or the Ghana Education Service, is a mammoth, it's like a, not a monster, but it's <laughs> mammoth, you know? And when you are that huge, you become what, sluggish. You sluggish. And so we, there were existing reforms that President, former President Kufo mm -hmm. had tried to bring into being. And we tried to do some of that, set up councils, set up the inspectorates, you know, uh, councils and the teaching councils mm -hmm. and other things. Teach absenteeism was a huge problem. And that was dealt with by having TABs, teacher accommodation blocks, built in some of the remote communities. I went, I was in Dafiama to supervise uh, uh, um, branch elections a couple of days ago. And then I remembered why Dafiama is close to my heart. It's because of the senior high school and the fact that we put up teacher accommodation blocks. So we passed there on the way and it's like a university called beautiful place. And you know, this is real access to education. So it's having some vision and knowing what, what to do with the scarce resources and having the international um, uh, foresight. I was lucky, I had Mahama Yariga as one of my deputies mm -hmm. and he also had this knowledge and this vision. And we went out and managed to achieve the impossible. <laughs> well, to, I know I don't have enough time to catalog all your achievements, unfortunately. But going forward, what should we expect of Betty Mould Idris? Well, I can't say more of the same because age has a way of holding you back. But I've always dreamt. I always believe in pursuing my dreams and my vision. And I've always been a leader because I think I've been, as I told you, I'm the eldest child and the only girl brought up in a matrilineal mm -hmm. system. And with leading, I'm now vice chairman of the NDC. So one wants to be able to lead a political party. We try to lead a nation. And those dreams were... <laughs> 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 those dreams and visions were severely dealt with. <laughs> I wouldn't say by men, you but see? they were severely <laughs> dealt with. Life deals you these blows. In life, when you stumble, even when you fall, the true test of a person's quality is that you can pick yourself up or you enable people to pick you up and you are put back. The chairmanship the for the NDC? It's, um, a, it's, it's something that is not impossible. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> Folks, you see, this is how it takes to be a great person. You need to educate yourself, you need to expose yourself, and you need to get experiences. And above all, if you fall, pick yourself up, 
and move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. It has been wonderful. Thank you. Until I come back to you with another personality, you know what? Thank you so much for watching. But the number is 024-366-2001. 024-366-2001. That's Tanti's fashion. They give me the shirts for the show. So give them a call and get yourself a nice shirt. Thank you for watching.